You may have uh, heard uh, Ken on, on Fresh Air a couple of days ago. Uh, his book is just launching now. Uh, we're really thrilled for, to have Ken here, a frequent collaborator with New America Foundation. Uh, the president of Terror Free Tomorrow, a former federal prosecutor who was also a counsel in the House in Iran Contra investigation. That's a, a while ago now. You look too young to have been a lead, a lead counsel in the Iran Contra investigation. A regular contributor to CNN and to uh, many other uh, uh, newspapers. And um, so, what we had discussed uh, was that Ken would give. Uh, sort of 15 to 20 minutes of opening remarks, and then I would um, ask him some questions, and then we'd throw it open to the floor. And as you see, uh, Ken and Andy have very kindly provided some Indonesian food. Usually, we provide just nothing here. So <laughs> this is a major departure for us. Uh, thank you, Ken. Thanks very much, Peter. Uh, I, I will start out with a few brief remarks. Yeah, uh, it is on. I think it's just a matter of the the audio guy just needs to bring him up. All right. How 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 are we good now? I, everyone can hear me. Usually that's never a problem, people hearing me. So uh, actually, usually what people say, tone it down a little bit, Ken. <laughs> uh, the title of the book. Let's start with that. Terrorist and love. What do I mean by terrorist and love? It's usually the first question. I'm asked. Well, the book tells the story. It profiles six people and their journeys. Some from their childhood to jihad and some away from jihad. Some towards a more radical jihad. But a theme that runs through the book is love or missing love. In Saudi Arabia, we find a couple, Abby and Miriam the jihadi Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> they fall madly in love. Childhood sweethearts. Except one problem. Abby doesn't have the $30,000 dowry to marry Miriam. Her father forbids the match, finds her, who's 20 years old, a man of well over 60, to take Miriam for $30,000 which in the father's defense is more than he earns in a year as a janitor at, or a guard at an elementary school. So Abby goes off to fight in noble jihad so he can meet Miriam, his love, in heaven. <coughs> Literally. Miriam goes too, escapes from this man who has her, to go and fight so they can die and meet again in heaven. Ahmad, nicknamed Bernie by the Americans, which you can find out why when you read the book. I think you should say. All right, I'll <laughs> give it away. <laughs> Bernie, you know, it's funny with him. I spent a lot of time with him, and he still to this day doesn't know why the Americans called him Bernie. Well, he had burns throughout his entire body, so that was kind of the gallows humor of American forces. They call him Bernie, but anyway, that's why he's called Bernie. Uh, anyway, he grows up in Saudi Arabia in a very conservative, traditional city in the heartland of the Arabian Peninsula. Never meets a woman outside his own family. And in fact, after the suicide attack, he goes, he's, he does go to Abu Ghraib of all places, which is what motivated him initially to go and fight in Iraq. He's scared to death when he gets there. But he meets an American army medic who shows him kindness, who shows him care, who nurses him back to health. Terrorists in love. There's another fellow from Saudi Arabia. He is heir to the Wahhab family. The Wahhab family in Saudi Arabia is the family of religious clerics descended from Muhammad Abdul Wahhab, the founder of the puritanical sect of Islam that is predominant in Saudi Arabia. And in fact, most people don't know it, there are really two royal families in Saudi Arabia, the Al Saud and the Wahhab. Anyway, this young man is an heir to this very, very important privileged family. He falls in love too, but he falls in love with another man, which is forbidden, terrorist in love. There's a story of Shahid. He, too, comes from a family of privilege. 
His grandfather was important in founding the state of Pakistan as a Muslim state. His father becomes a lieutenant colonel guarding that country's nuclear weapons. He goes to secular school. At age 11, he is brutally raped by the headmaster of the school. He then, several years later, falls in love from afar with a young, also fellow 13-year-old girl. He is beaten and humiliated as a result, turns to God for solace, and becomes increasingly radicalized, terrorist in love. So we see this in the book. I saw it throughout. I interviewed over 100 radicals and extremists throughout the Muslim world. A hundred in depth, there was many, many more that I don't count in that number who would just give rhetoric and so therefore it wasn't a meaningful interview. I'm talking about really getting to know these people on a, on a deep level. And this theme emerged again and again. Which is, let me, why did I do this and how did I do this? Before I get to some of the lessons we can learn from it. I was a federal prosecutor, I don't know whether Peter mentioned that, and also a congressional investigator. As a federal prosecutor, the model that any prosecutor, good prosecutor, would adopt, this is not unique to me, is to really understand the people you're prosecuting before you convict them, or are able to convict them. How, how does that really work? Um, I had a case involving organized crime, it was a Sicilian Mafia case. Uh, part of the series of cases that helped to bring down the mob. Mine was a small part of that. It was in New Jersey. I spent almost a year on a wiretap with the FBI 24-7 listening to every conversation this family had. And believe me, 99% of them, sometimes we'd have to minimize it because it was mostly private talk, was quite banal. But then when we did the initial round of 50 people, arrested 50 people, um, uh, over half of them ended up cooperating. I would spend not weeks with these guys, months, day in and day out talking to them, learning everything about them. Not only because it was necessary to bring down another 50 people in the next round, which is what happened because they became cooperating witnesses, but learning everything about their lives because when they hit that stand as a witness, they're going to be cross-examined and you needed to know everything as a prosecutor. After 9-11, this was not the model of the United States. We reacted to the events that happened. It's understandable, but we did react. We didn't try to understand who our adversaries were. We didn't adopt the prosecutorial model, which is to understand first, in depth, then successfully convict. So that was my model in talking to these people. It was I wanted to know everything about their, their lives so that I could understand them fully. And I think that gives you a very different perspective on, on who the people are and uh, what, uh, what uh, you can learn. What are the, some of the policy lessons? We'll talk about this more, but it, I'm also asked this. Today is actually the 10th anniversary of the American involvement in the war in Afghanistan. Ten years later, first of all, it's remarkable if you compare the marking and commemoration of the 10th anniversary of 9-11 with the 10th anniversary of the beginning of America's involvement in the Afghan war. One had much notice and fanfare, and today is passing by virtually unnoticed. Why? I would maintain the reason is because 10 years after our involvement in the Afghan war, we're still at a loss to understand what's really going on on the ground in Afghanistan. We're fighting. We've lost over 2,000 American men and women service members in this conflict, yet we are not closer to understanding. This book provides one of the first inside looks into Mullah Omar, who is the Taliban leader. One of the people profiled in the book is Malik, he was a dream seer to Mullah Omar, kind of a Rasputin, if you will. And he uh, uh, would interpret dreams from Mullah Omar. In fact, he would give him his own dreams. There's a very powerful scene in the book 
where he's with Mullah Omar. And uh, he's giving a dream, and this was about a year after the Taliban leadership had reestablished themselves in Pakistan in Quetta. And Mullah Omar used this dream to interpret um, why he should go and fight in America with, against Americans in jihad. We'll get more into the policy later. What did I see in this book? I, I saw that for many, two kind of startling facts I think most people are not aware of and I wasn't. For most people who go and fight, they're doing this out of a motivation to do good. They're doing this out of a motivation because they believe they're doing the right thing. They believe they're serving God. However, among many of the leaders, an untold story is the corruption and the manipulation of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Many of these guys became disillusioned because of the lies, manipulation, and outright theft and corruption. Now, some Taliban leaders I spoke to would justify the corruption and the drug dealing that the Taliban in, is engaged in by saying this was just a mean to create resources that help with the jihad. But it's not a justification that oftentimes goes down well among the rank and file. And um, for some it does, but for many it doesn't. And this is an unexploited opportunity, I think, that we have not seized upon. Uh, is and an untold story that could weaken very much this movement, I think, over time. What kind of message do I take away from all of this? I remember one fellow, I referred to him, Shahid. Shahid and I were sitting in a restaurant after a long day of talking. And we were eating food. And the food we were eating reminded me of a dream that I had that morning which, in innocence, I related to Shahid. Oh, Shahid, here's this jihadi. Imagine the scene. He's got this long beard. He's got all these white robes and, you know, the whole nine yards. I mean, he, he, he looks kind of like, to me, Osama bin Laden, and frankly. And I'm sitting across the table with this guy, eating away. And this was food that was foreign to him because we, the, the Pakistani restaurant where he wanted to eat was full. So we had to go to a, a you know, Arab Middle Eastern restaurant. So we're sitting there eating, and he wouldn't touch the food, but we asked 10 times, is this is halal and all of that. And I almost felt like asking, is this kosher? But anyway. Um, uh, but he, we're sitting there, and he, we're eating the food. It reminds me of the dream. And then all of a sudden, he says to me, he becomes very quiet. And he says, he whispers, you have the dream that I've been waiting my life to have. I don't know what he was talking about. You had the vision that I wanted to have. And then he began to almost interrogate me in great detail about the nature of the dream. What well, did you see the, the man's face? It was a dream with a horse and somewhat vague like most dreams are. Did you see the man's face? No, I didn't see the face. I told you everything I saw. I mean, I don't. And then he had all these questions about it. And, it, and, then he, and then he cries out in the middle of this restaurant, Alu Akbar. And everyone turns around, Alu Akbar, Alu Akbar. You had the dream where you saw the Prophet Muhammad. And because you didn't see his face, that means that you had a true dream. And the devil can never take the form of the Prophet in a true dream. But this was a transformative experience for Shahid. He no longer. He was moving away from jihad. He was once part of the, his colleagues were once, later bombed the Marriott in Islamabad. So these are dangerous people, very committed. And he, so he moved away, from, he was already moving away from this. But this experience with me as a Westerner, as a Jew, he saw me in a totally different light at that moment. That I could have the dream where I had this vision in his mind. I never thought of it that way. It was an actually a transformative experience for both of us. And I think, too, of Kamal in Saudi Arabia. I met his father. His father is one of the most important religious clerics and officials, not only in Saudi Arabia, but in the Muslim world. The idea that I was an American, a Jew, and an infidel, I was headed for hell. But Kamal went for a long, through a long journey, which you can read about in the book, where he goes from being a committed jihadi, but at the at the end, no, he's got a very diff different notion. Every American, 
every Christian, every Jew can go to heaven in his vision. So I, I had hope. Now, I'll leave you with one story that was somewhat paradoxical. I was with this Taliban guy, and we spent the whole day talking. And then at the end of the day, he grabs my hand in friendship. You know, this is holding my hand in the Pashtun world, which most Taliban are, is a sign of friendship. It's not a sign of anything else, like shaking one's hand when you meet them. So he's holding my hand in friendship, and he says to me, and he begins to recite verses from the Quran, and he's crying because a holy man cries when he cites the verses of the Quran. And he says to me, um, the day of judgment, this is what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, the day of judgment will not come until every Jew is killed. And if the Jew is lying, hiding behind a rock, the rock will cry out, oh, Muslim, true believer, kill the Jew. If the Jew is hiding behind a tree, the tree will help. Uh, cry out, oh Muslim, there's a Jew behind me. Only the Garkar tree will not cry out because it is the tree of the Jews. <laughs> and he's saying this to me. This is actually, a saying. he's saying this to me while holding my hand in friendship. I felt perfectly, at that moment I was uncomfortable in the interview, obviously. <laughs> um, but I didn't feel any danger from him. I felt friendship and caring from him. And he, he would never have killed me or done anything to me in that room. But on the battlefield, I, I, he's a committed Taliban fighter, and uh, uh, he, he might well have done it. So I, I'm not sure what lesson we can learn from that. Um, makes a good story. Um, but I think somehow there is a lesson from that. Somehow my experience meeting these hardened jihadis, seeing a lot of their good desires. There's one story in the book where it's a little different from that, because this man, Zedi, spent two decades as, in his word, a career terrorist for Islam. He's more of a thug. There's nothing endearing about this fellow. Um, and that's presented in the book. And he actually worked closely with the ISI, which is the Pakistani Army Intelligence Agency, um, training terrorists, thousands he trained, and also smuggling arms to the Taliban. So as he said to me, you Americans are really funding both sides in the war on terror. You've given $20 billion to the Pakistani government. And they, in turn, paying me so that I can train terrorists. They, in turn, giving me arms so that I can go across the border and smuggle them to the Taliban. And actually, he told me in 2008 that the ISI was harboring bin Laden inside Pakistan. And he said it was northwest, first in Chitral and then in northwest Pakistan. So he, the day that bin Laden was found in Abbottabad was not, was not a particular surprise to me, because he told me generally that's where bin Laden was being protected. He also trained, this is very important to remember, he trained terrorists in a camp in Mansara, in the mountains. This is right next to Abadabad. Um, uh, he went to meet with Al-Qaeda operatives and ISI people together in Abadabad. So something was happening. On that note, <laughs> I'll sit down for my, interro my interrogation. I'm on the other <laughs> end now. Um, okay. You know, at one point, we jokingly talked about the book being called A Jew Among the Jihadis. Um, mm -hmm. And what did you, uh, I mean, what difference did that or did that not make to you as a when you were doing the reporting? I think it made a big difference. I, I wouldn't start out with this, but I kind of like to, and maybe this is from my time as a prosecutor, you know, from child molesters, which had to be the most vile people I've ever interrogated. Sitting in a room with a child molester for 12 hours is not fun, believe me. Your skin crawls. But from child molesters to, you know, committed criminals, I feel at some point in the process, and this is more an art than a science, a little bit of provocation is a good thing. And, you know, at some point I usually would tell the people, you know, I'm, I'm Jewish. Or like I told Shahad, I had this dream or whatever. Uh, and just to kind of upset the apple cart, just to accept the, uh, you know, I, I, it's not something I would lead with, but, and I found it very helpful. And most people really kind of do a double take because I would say that of the hundred or so interviews, I, I would say I don't think anyone had ever met, most of them had never, almost all of them had never met an American before, let alone a Jew. And so this was somehow a great enemy in their mind. And when we had established a rapport, and I would say that, it would almost kind of turn the tables around. I think one of the themes of your book, which um, 
may not be entirely comfortable for some readers is that this is a lot to do with religion. I mean, in these most of the most of the case studies that you have, maybe Zeddy, the thug, is <laughs> it didn't. But from these were very committed religious zealots usually. Usually, they're very committed religious zealots, and I found this among. I picked these people. I should say a caveat. Six cases do not represent why everyone joins jihad, obviously. Right. And they certainly don't represent Muslims as a whole. Um, and that's an, uh, that should be an obvious caveat, and I stated in the introduction. But I think these six were representative of what I found among the larger group that I interviewed, and that's why I picked them. And for most, it is a religious calling. Um, they really feel, and that's why it's an incumbent, not on the United States, to impose our values on other people. The change has to come from the Muslim world itself and from religious scholars and clerics interpreting Islam. And uh, you see in this book some people doing that. You see them going in the jihad and then reinterpreting the faith like Kamal to be open and inclusive and tolerant and that that is the true Islam and not the teaching of Al-Qaeda. But we can't forget that Al-Qaeda and the Taliban read selected verses and take selected messages like this m fellow Malik and interpret that as meaning that this is the word of God. One of the themes of the, at least the Taliban sections is the importance of dreams, which I think is not well, I mean, and I guess the sort of uh, part of that observation is I think one of the things you come away with from, from, from the book is understanding, you know, these people inhabit a very different mental universe that, I mean, because I think it, with the natural tendency that we all have to do sort of mirror image, meaning that, you know, basically everybody's kind of similar. I mean, and I guess some of the themes of your book suggest that people are, there are some universal values, et cetera. But at the end of the day, I took away that most of these people were actually had very different views about the world, That's right. very different conceptions. And I mean, the, to talk a little bit about, about the dream, because most people don't put so, so much value on their own dreams. Well, uh, the dreams are, are, are key. Among the Taliban, uh, Mullah Omar's authority as the leader of the Taliban comes from this dream he had and that the Taliban fighters know about where he saw um, Allah take the form of a man and this first led him to fight. And then another dream he had first led him to wear the cloak of the Prophet Muhammad which is kept in Kandahar at a mosque and is a holy relic. And this was considered a great sign and then the dream of this fellow Malik, there were two dreams he had. Um, which Mullah Omar was apparently very moved by, but more to the point, some of the more worldly Taliban, some of the Mullah Omar's deputies use these dreams to, were more manipulative about them. And they may have believed them, they may not have, but so Mullah Omar's kind of a spiritual figure. And what I found, I mean, there's a lot of kind of fashionable talk, if you will, today about different Taliban factions, so to speak, Haqqani, this, that. What I found among all the Taliban I interviewed was that everyone really revered Mullah Omar as kind of a spiritual guide. Um, not necessarily as a battlefield leader, but as kind of uh, the, the, the father figure of the movement. movement. Yeah, the and, and it came from this dream culture uh, and dream interpretation, which was very prominent, and not only among the Taliban, but among, um, among the Saudi radicals I met. Among, it was universal. Uh, yeah, the great uh, Pakistani journalist Rahi Mullah Yousafzai told me before 9-11 that he talked to Mullah Omar, and Mullah Omar asked him about a dream that he'd had about a White House burning, and if it had any kind of significance. So clearly, it was, he, Omar has communicated to other people this thing about his, the importance of his dreams. That's right. In terms of, uh, you know, what were the mechanics of actually, you know, you were in, parts of Pakistan where there is a Taliban presence or you're in Saudi Arabia where obviously there's a great deal of control of uh, people, independent researchers from the outside coming in. So talk us through kind of your, you know, the process by which you were able to meet people and get permissions and, and get the kind of access that you got. It, it, it varied from each country. Um, it wasn't uniform. Uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, I initially met a lot of the people in the so-called euphemistically termed care center, which is a halfway house that the Saudi government established to rehabilitate jihadis. And I, if anyone's interested, I can talk about that. I think I've interviewed more people there than anyone else and spent more time than anyone else at that facility. 
So two of the jihadis portrayed in, in this book went through that. A third I met through somebody in there, it's kind of off the radar, uh, and that's the member of the royal family, the religious branch. In Pakistan it was different. Uh, we had done a lot of work in Pakistan, and I made connections through uh, American intelligence officials and largely through uh, Pakistani journalists on the ground who um, directed me to folks. And then from the people I met, I would meet other people. And some of that's described in the book. You know, uh, you mentioned Bernie in the opening. I, what happened to Bernie? And why? Because you didn't quite explain that. What, no, what I is didn't. his What is his story? Um, should I read a passage from the book, or should I explain his story? I, whichever you, you feel happy doing. Um, I feel happy doing either one. <laughs> How about a little of both? A little of both would be great. Because <laughs> I was going to read a passage from the book, and then I didn't. So let's just do it. Of the 43 jihadi inmates I met in Saudi Arabia and interviewed, Ahmad al Shayea, Bernie, had to be the most striking. His entire body bore the scars of the first suicide bomber in Iraq who had survived his attack. His face was covered with red pustules. His nose curved to a strange hooked point, almost like a ski jump. The fingers on his right hand ended in a stump that resembled melted candle wax, while his left hand fingers were twisted like the roots of a miswax stick, jihadis regularly chew in imitation of the Prophet Muhammad. And that, by the way, tastes exactly like the bitter herbs from a Passover Seder. His fingernails were little more than yellow brown stumps, the color of toes infected with athlete's foot. Sitting in the prison faux tented reception area or modules with the air conditioning going full throttle, I was accompanied by Dr. Ali, Ahmad's prison psychologist, a phenomenal host as with whom I shared many long dinners and who had received his doctorate in psychology from the University of Edinburgh. Ahmad was shy and modest. It took much prompting from me, and most of all, Dr. Ali, who would prod Ahmad with what they had discussed in therapy sessions. As is fitting for both a student of Sigmund Freud and the Holy Quran, Dr. Ali helped Ahmad begin his singular life story of a failed suicide bomber with a dream, even if a dream from Abu Ghraib. Burned beyond recognition, his skin charred and dark, Ahmad al Shayea could dream of only one thing, dates. Not the light tan Sukari dates his family had once so proudly grown in the center of Saudi Arabia. The best dates in all Bereda, his grandfather always bragged. Ahmad couldn't stop dreaming of the rival dates from the distant eastern province of Saudi Arabia, the bitter black cloth states his grandfather always scorned. The Holy Quran told Ahmad that as a moderate fighter in the way of jihad, he would be eternally nourished in paradise by date palms. Yet instead of the sweetest sukari that grandfather said would be the food of heaven, his veins were hooked to salty water. Instead of wearing robes of silk and reclining on jeweled couches as a holy book pledge, Ahmad lay on a stiff white bed. Missing, too, were the dark-eyed, full-breasted virgins chased as pearls, offered by Allah the Most High to any martyr. He hadn't reunited with his family as promised either. His younger brother, cherished grandfather, beloved mother, he was alone. Ahmad had been thrown into the fires of hell, as the Holy Quran warned all sinners. He'd come to Iraq to fight the Americans, a noble jihad, but his suicide mission instead had ended at Abu Ghraib. And all Ahmad could think of or dream of was dates. Essentially, Bernie was, uh, uh, I mean, he was recruited by Al-Qaeda, and then they tricked him into a suicide mission. He didn't really fully understand he was That's going. That's correct. On. And you know, there's an interesting story. Would you explain how that happened? There's an interesting story. Ahmad ri arrives, or Bernie arrives in Iraq. He's with 45 other jihadis. And the leader of Al-Qaeda is exhorting them all to suicide missions. He's saying, this is the most noble thing you can do, is to die on a suicide mission. 
die um, uh, 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 and, and serve God. In any event, he, um, among the 45 people, the Al-Qaeda leader asked, are there any volunteers? Anyone want to join? Not a single person raised their hand. Nobody wanted to join. As Ahmad said to me, I came to Iraq to fight. I wanted to fight. I wanted to do some good on earth before I go to heaven. I don't want to go right away. So that was his feeling, and apparently shared by a lot of them. So the day um, he, he was kept, in, they didn't train him. They didn't show him how to use a gun. They kept the jihadis in kind of an isolation. They had nothing to do. They would pray five times a day. The boredom was endless. They would move them from location to location, um, from safe house to safe house, because the Americans might come. He never saw any Americans. But there was a sense of impending doom at every moment. He, he's desperate to do something. He's complaining to the leaders, I came here to fight. He's very sick from the food. He's very lonely. He misses his family. He, he came with a friend. He's separated from his friend. Um, uh, he, he's all alone. He keeps complaining and said, finally, we'll send you on a noble mission. They bring him to Baghdad. And they say, all you have to do is drive this truck. Don't worry about anything else. So I don't know how to drive a truck. Don't worry, we'll go with you. We'll show you every step of the way. So the morning he gets in the truck, for the first time he's in Iraq, somebody actually talks to him. The two other jihadis are joking around with him. And it's very much, you'll have to read the book because I've been asked about this, but I somehow don't, <laughs> don't, don't want to state it publicly. Read the book, what they're talking about. Kind of what any two young men, uh, three young men talk about um, between the ages of 16 and 25. You can use your imagination. <laughs> That's what they're talking about. <laughs> well, should I say? Or, uh, read the book. Read, read the, the book. book. <laughs> so you'll see what they're talking about. This is a PG uh, kind of. Yeah, well, maybe even a yeah, little bit higher, I think, what they're talking about. So they're talking about this and, you know, while they're about. And then right before a concrete barrier, the Iraqi jihadis suddenly they drive, they suddenly drop out of the. Dr jump out of the truck and say, I'm going to drive it ahead. And he has to take over the steering wheel because the truck is swearing, sw swerving, I'm sorry. So he has to take over the steering wheel. He said, I didn't know what was going on. And he said, but I knew so something bad was about to happen. And literally seconds later, the truck, as soon as they got out, they detonated it. It was full of, of 60, 26 tons of liquid explosives. It blew up. Um, it killed six people, innocent people. And uh, by some... As Ahmad said, I was saved by God. God wanted me to live for a reason. God wanted me to tell the world what Al-Qaeda is truly like. The, uh, the Saudis, you know, there's some criticism of the Saudi uh, rehabilitation program. Thank you very Thank much. You, <laughs> you okay? I don't, know what, I don't know what happened. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> there's some... There's some uh, criticism of the Saudi rehabilitation program that people, you know, some, there's some recidivism and blah, blah, blah. But, I mean, Saudi officials that I've spoken to say that's not in really necessarily the point of the program. It, you know, rehabilitation is fine, but the point of the program, really, if you step back from it, is to show to the Saudi people that we have done absolutely everything we can to rehabilitate these people. And if they go back to, you know, being militants or terrorists, you know, it, essentially that they've you know, they've been afforded every opportunity. Is that kind of what? Is, how do you ass, how do you assess the Saudi program um, overall? I I I I, I have a slight. Uh, I'm not sure that's exactly right. right. I mean, I think that's you know when I first went to Saudi Arabia and first visited this uh, facility, I've been to a lot of jails as a prosecutor. It's still a jail. It's a nice jail, but if you're not allowed to have your freedom, it's still a jail. Um, when I went to this, and the sign read, um, uh, Department of Interior, Ministry of Interior, which is the most feared and powerful agency of the government of Saudi Arabia. It's, it comprises the secret police. So, Department of Public Relations, Care Center. So I said afterwards <laughs> to my Saudi host, I'm not quite sure that that's the message you want to give. So that it's about public relations, <laughs> um, and this is just a show to show the outside world and the citizens that we're really doing everything we can. Th they do on Saudi TV. I mean, I've seen many of people who are former jihadis interviewed on Saudi TV. They go into the Saudi schools. So I think that is the most valuable aspect of this program. 
that these young men who went to jihad and who are so-called rehabilitated um, go out into the community. But there was apparently this public relations aspect of it to say, look, we're doing something to the outside world and to themselves. They have, to their credit, had a fair amount of success with the program, I think. Um, there is recidivism. Um, there are people, it's described in the book, Saeed al-Shiri, who um, uh, Kamal knew um, and who told other people at the, at the prison that this was all an act. And he was going, as soon as he got out of this place, he was going to go back from jihad. And indeed, he became the number two commander of al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. So, and he told that to the Americans. He said, I was just, when I went to Afghanistan, I just went to buy you know, rugs for my family's furniture store in Riyadh. And, 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 and you know, bin Laden has divorced himself in Islam. And he told Kamal and other people at the center who he trusted that it was just a, you know, it was a lie for jihad in his words. So a lot of people go through this so-called re rehabilitation and just say what, the, what they think others want to hear. But it's been successful with other people. I, I think overall it's basically a success with that caveat, yeah. right? Yeah. Is, um, you know, you were writing the book and interviewing these folks before the Arab Spring. What, what do you think they would have said about it? Or did they say anything that indicated that, that they thought change was coming or that Al-Qaeda's ideology was dying? Yeah, most of the, um, uh, uh, most of the people in the book that I've interviewed, I've stayed in contact with. So I had actually gotten reactions to the Arab Spring from them. Um, and one is mentioned in the book, and Kamal uh, thought it was a really... Um, is that your phone? I don't, it might be. Okay. Uh, it might be it stopped. If it's mine, it stopped, and I forgot okay. to turn it off. <laughs> That's terrible. The host uh, who's speaking <laughs> to you forgets to tell off the cell phone. Um, uh, but his reaction to it was, you know, this was, this, he said to me, this is the face of the true Islam. In Tahrir Square, we have Christians and Jews, men and women together, bowing before the only sovereign we should ever bow before, the Almighty. Right, well, let's throw it over to questions. Uh, if you have one, can you wait for the microphone, identify yourself, we'll start here. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Eftah Harusin. I work for Voice of America, partially to the Border Region Service. We broadcast to the Border Region of Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, I assume the book must be very interesting as you speak on some of the... Um, if you allow me, there is just a small joke in about the suicide members in our Pashtun area as I come from Peshawar. A suicide member goes to a place where he won a detonates and it just did not uh, went in fully and he fell unconscious in the hospital. And then he says that, oh my God, I was promised 72 version when he sees around the, the nurses around him and he said, these are just few. And then the doctor <laughs> comes and he says, um, this is just a joke shared by um, many people on, on the text in, in, in their cell phones and um, on the web. Um, my question is, uh, did you give any attention to the Saudi Wahhabi Islam influence on the militant Islam around the Muslim world, and particularly the one in Afghanistan and yes. uh, I, I think in this is uh, this is the book is not, and, and Peter wrote the foreword to the book, and Peter makes clear in the book in the foreword that this is not a book of analysis or policy. It's a book of trying to really understand from the inside. Somebody said to me who, who read the book. And I've never seen this show, so maybe some of you have seen it. There's an HBO show called In Treatment, where apparently people are, are, you know, go through their intimate confessions to psychiatrists, and you get to observe that. And th this person said, your book reminds me of In Treatment Among the Jihadis, where you get to hear their inner thoughts and their inner motivations. So the book is not really a policy book. It's not really set up that way. But it does discuss your point. And this is very, very important because from Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia has spent billions of dollars exporting its interpretation of uh, Islam from the Wahhab tradition. And I think that's why the story of Kamal in the book is so important because if that Wahhab tradition can be somewhat modified and less strict 
and Waha and, and Kamau, who's a descendant, believes it can. He's going to the texts of his forefather saying, the clerics of today are misinterpreting Wahhab himself. So this is real hope I see because it has been a huge problem in Indonesia where I've spent a lot of time, in Pakistan, Afghanistan. This export of the, the Saudi Wahhabi faith has really, um, um, you know, they're local people there, uh, like Maududi. But again, Maududi was very close to the Wahhabis. People don't realize this. He went to Saudi Arabia. Maududi, to, for those who don't know, is kind of the premier founder. Uh, he was the founder of the Jamaat party, which is talked about in the book, in, in, in Pakistan, which is um, a religious party, um, uh, kind of like the Muslim Brothers of Pakistan, if you will. But he got a lot of his ideas from the Wahhab tradition, and he actually, um, uh, that was important to him. So I think your point is very well taken. By the way, has anybody uh, that you profile in the book read the book yet? No. And Do you think they're going to be uh, happy or unhappy? No, they're going to be unhappy. Uh, no. it, it, it's one thing, look, they knew I was writing a book, and I was upfront about that. I told that to everyone I was interviewing. But it's one thing, and some of them I spent a lot of time with and went back and forth continually. But it's one thing to intellectually know that you're telling your story, and then it's, it's a friendly forum, and you're talking, and you're discussing things. It's quite another to actually read it in print and in a society where a lot of these revelations are, are, for any human being, the fact that they were raped at 11 years old is not something that they really like publicly displayed. So for some of them, I did take steps to protect their identities um, because uh, both because of the personal nature and because of the real danger that they will be in if exposed. I'm Mitzi Wirth. I'm with the Naval Postgraduate School. I'd like to know how you se how you basically set up these interviews. How did you how did you get them to open up to you? Um, and did you know it was I mean, was that relatively easy? And did you know that that was going to be easy to do when you got in there? No, I didn't know it was going to necessarily happen. This book kind of wrote itself in that I was doing a lot of interviews of of, of radicals more for the public opinion polling that I was leading in um, many Muslim-majority countries. So it wasn't that I was necessarily uh, had in mind to write a book, but some of these people I came across, their stories were so compelling. They were so different from everything I thought I knew. Um, every, every image I had before of these kind of evil, horrible people that it, it led itself. And um, uh, you know, I, I don't, you know, I can't account for that other than, say, to some degree it was luck and that I've spent more than two decades uh, interviewing and interrogating people in this kind of a way. Um, I'm used to it and, you know, I've had many criminals open up to me and, um, you know, just like after they open up to me, you know, and then I end up, you know, prosecuting or something, they're not necessarily so happy about the results. So, but you'd be surprised, I mean, you know, uh, I'll take two TV shows for people who are a fan of TV. There was one 24 with Jack Bauer, and he would torture people. I right, tell me what I want to know, and all of that kind of stuff. And you know what? That doesn't happen in the real world. You never get confessions that way. That's nonsense. It never happens. I've never seen anything remotely like that. Then you look at the other show, Law and Order, where they kind of befriend the guy and they get him to talk and all that. That's more realistic. That's really the way people open up. And it re really was amateurs. If you look back at the history of how America got involved in torturing people after 9-11, it was people who had no experience in this area were writing up studies and doing it. And that the professionals, and many at the FBI, they'll tell you this is, this is, this is just um, kind of Hollywood 24 type stuff. It's not real. So, you know, I, 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 part of it I did based on my experience. Over here. Thank you, Rosh. Uh, th thank you. Uh, Michael Kraft, I'm a former State Department counterterrorism official, now a consultant. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, um, from your overview and from your initial description of the, some of the love or emotional factors, uh, do you have any overall observation to what extent most of these people were motivated by some kind of emotional factor as opposed to policy or, or poverty and also to what extent or what drives this seems to be a common theme of, of blaming the West and America in particular for the 
you know, for the outside problems. I still remember when we first went into Afghanistan, a Pakistani uh, who was interviewed on BBC was saying, everything that's wrong in the world is the fault of America and the, and the, and the British. Uh, do you see any policy implications or suggestions in terms of the public diplomacy effort? Yep. No, I, I, I certainly do. And what, look, I think the important point to remember is no one's, everyone is complex. Every human being has a different story, and we all operate out of mixed motives. What has been ignored is what we have done in the West, I think, is to generalize why people go to jihad and, and, and focus on, focus on the political factors. They're certainly there, of course. You know, and how do you disentangle them? Look at Abby who goes to fight because he wants to meet Miriam in heaven. Was that a political factor? Well, if we weren't involved in Iraq, how would he be found an outlet for it? So there is politics involved. Was it a cultural factor? Well, it certainly was because he couldn't marry his girlfriend because of the $30,000. Was it a religious factor? Absolutely, because he thought he would go to heaven to marry her. Was it a personal factor? You bet. He was a very unhappy young man when he couldn't marry his sweetheart. And to see his sweetheart married is a very interesting scene in the book how they manipulate her into marrying uh, this man. And I'm not going to give it away because I do want you to read the book. <laughs> um, I, you know, I'll be candid about that. So, um, so there's these complex motives. Um, and, and then, but what's interesting, too, is why people become disillusioned with the ra radicals. Usually it's because of the corruption that they see, because they have this kind of idealism propelling them and then they see the corruption, in, which is endemic to everything in human nature. So I think that's a missed opportunity in public diplomacy. I think these people's stories is a missed opportunity in public diplomacy. But most of all, I think as Americans, what we must remember is we cannot impose our values on other people. That is where a lot of the anti-Americanism comes from, this feeling of imposing our values. I led a survey in Saudi Arabia. And Saudi said the most important priorities they had for their future were free elections, free press, and free speech. The policy from the United States they hated the most, even more than what they viewed as American unconditional support for Israel, which believe me they hated, was America trying to impose its vision of democracy on the rest of the world, so, and particularly the Middle East. So I think that's the lesson. We need a humbler foreign policy. We need to go back to Teddy Roosevelt, speak softly and carry a big stick. And you know, even Bush, when he ran in 2000, said a humbler foreign policy. We didn't get that, but that was the right words. Yeah, following up on, on Mike Kraft's question, um, I think you know, we're now 10 years after 9-11, and Jason Burke has actually just written a piece for us on the AFPAC channel um, based on his new book, The 9-11 Wars. And he says, you know, one of the first lessons that we have learned after 10 years of sort of thinking about this is it's not who becomes a radical, it's how they become a radical. And, you know, that sort of, that work began in a sense with Mark Sageman's first really great book uh, um, in which he basically showed that it was a group process. To what extent uh, that, that brought people to the jihad, often it was family members or friends or people joined the group you know, if you look at the 9-11 plot, many, you know, was, they joined as friends in a group. Did you find that in your, in your interviews or not? Um, yes and no. Yeah. Some of them, and I found that throughout the 100 interviews, and, and that's, and, and, and Sageman's work is uh, exceptional, but it's based on, on a lot of secondary sources and westernized right. environment, so it may be different than what I found. But I found sometimes a group dynamic is very important. Bernie or Ahmad joined because of his friend, and it was a group endeavor. Abby didn't talk to anyone, went off to fight because he wanted to die and meet his sweetheart in heaven. Um, uh, Shahid, uh, uh, again, it was a, uh, there was a group dynamic that propelled him, but also an individual dynamic. Kamal was through the internet. He became radicalized on his own through the internet. So it, just depends on the person, and I don't think one size, and I found this throughout all my interviews, everyone has a different life story, and I think, um, uh, you know, we have to be careful about generalizing. Over here. 
Thanks. Uh, my name is Mithab Karim. I'm an academic, uh, recently retired from Pew Research Center. Uh, I have, uh, I heard your interview yesterday on NPR, I believe, right? Yes. I was driving and yes, thank some, you. I had some interesting questions to come, but I have two clarifications and a question. I have read, uh, I'm a Muslim, I read Quran thoroughly in English because uh, I understand that better than Arabic or my own language, which is Urdu. And I found it nowhere saying that a person who is a jihadi and he kills others would go to heaven. It's nowhere in the Quran. And it's purely misinterpretation of likes of Osama bin Laden who perhaps know Arabic and they tell people who are Pashtuns or other Pakistanis that, or anywhere else who don't know Arabic that that's what the Quran says. That's one. Uh, it, rather it says that a person who kills others is uh, one person kills humanity. So for sure a terrorist would never go to heaven. That's the belief of Muslims. The second one, it, it's very clearly said in Quran. The second one, I have never read in Quran that uh, a Jew or uh, any other person, especially Jew and uh, uh, a Christian, would go to, uh, go to hell. Because uh, Muslims are allowed to marry uh, a Christian and a Jew because they're uh, men of the books. And uh, so I'm without conversion. So that means that if a person marries a Jew or a Christian, the spouse will go to hell. So it's not true though. And that again, the person who told you this, he didn't know this apparently, he was misinterpreted. These, uh, after having said that, uh, let me uh, explain. I'm. Uh, uh, I have. No, it's going to have to be a question. Yeah, it's it's a question related to religion. Uh, I have been studying uh, sociology of religion. That's my field. That uh, you know, in each society, there are people who are radicals. They are extremists, irrespective of religion, irrespective of race. We have seen in every religion. We had IRA in okay, Ireland. Okay, I'm sorry. And we had others. There's so, got to be a question. So it's I heard from you, at least perhaps my misinterpretation, that it's Islam which is moving them towards extremism. Is that, is that the right way to look at it? it? It's their interpretation of Islam that's moving, and, and this is discussed yeah, in the book. You. No, I, I'm, I'm, I don't have a view on that. I mean, the, this book chronicles Muslims who interpret their faith differently from you, and some who interpret it as you interpret it. And it chronicles both, and I'm not a Muslim. I can't interpret it. I've read the Quran too, and I think you have to read the book to see the context of it. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Kami Bert. I write for the Pakistani Spectator, and I'm a Punjabi, and I have Wahhabi and Deoband background. I went to Madrasa because my family was too poor to send me to any fancy school. and. Uh, what I talk with them, I talk with several of them in 2005, I was in Pakistan, and uh, they are very kind of high ranking in these are lashkar e taiba And since I speak Punjabi, and they spoke very openly, uh, my question to you is, I honestly found them very ordinary people like myself, who didn't have job, and they just had a lot of ambitions, they couldn't get things they wanted in their lives, and after two or three hours, I took a nap, you know, in their offices, and just went here and there, at the end of two or three hours, once they are exhausted, they talk about getting an American visa. Uh, they want to learn how much money they could make in America. And on the top of that, I don't know, I'm not an Islamic scholar, but I heard that when you go to heaven, uh, you get women, when they drink, like red drink, I would guess, mm -hmm. uh, wine, you could see from here. So at the end, they want white women, basically. <laughs> so okay. <laughs> well, so I, I, did you observe those kind of? You know? I, absolutely. I mean, I, I had this experience many times with jihadis, and we had a long discussion. And then at the end of it, they would turn to me and say, "How can you help me get a visa to come to the United States?" Well, in fact, I mean, you know, Ken, uh, as he sort of indicated, and I just want to expand. You know, Ken has done some of the best polling uh, of any organization in the Muslim world in all sorts of countries, including Saudi, the first really independent poll in Saudi Arabia. And I think one of the takeaways from your polling is that, yes, there's a rejection of American kind of imposition of democracy, but there's usually huge numbers want an American visa or a better, uh, a more open American uh, regime when it comes to visits and this sort of thing. There's, so, there's absolutely no question about that. And it's kind of a love-hate relationship with the United States. I mean, 
you know, most jihadis I met really, I mean, you'll read it in the book. I mean, how pro-American they are. Um, it's astonishing. It's absolutely astonishing. What do you mean by that? I mean that while they don't want the United States telling them what to do, they love American TV shows, they love American culture, even very religious Islamic people uh, just have a lot of admire, admiration for the United States. Uh, it, when, when it comes to American foreign policy and what they view as America's role in the world, that's when it breaks down. This gentleman here. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I was curious to know, what was the impetus behind creating this book and what do you hope to achieve by it? And more importantly, wh why the title terrorist in the book itself? Um, the impetus for the book really came from my feeling, um, and, and this was how I started the organization, that we were responding to 9-11 by reacting rather than trying to understand. It's very important to understand, not only for dialogue, but to respond correctly. I mean, think of this, if, if, if these, most of these people are motivated by good, most of these people are motivated by a desire to, to follow their religion, how is a completely militarized response going to change that? It's a question. In front here. <coughs> I'm Al Richman, former State Department. Uh, one, I wanted you to clarify, Ken, do you mean on the complaints about American democracy we were not supporting what we advocate? That is, we're supporting non-democratic regimes. I wanted you to elaborate that. Second, it's a widespread policy issue. What is the footprint of American, uh, American forces in Arab countries? How much of that is an underlying motive? Please. You know, it, it, it's the feeling, I'll just tell another kind of funny story from the book uh, that illustrates this. Kamal said to me, um, you know, Bonanza was apparently Osama bin Laden's favorite TV show. And he goes, he says to me, I'm sure this is a little tongue-in-cheek, but I'm sure this is a CIA or Mossad plot because how could Bonanza possibly be Bin Laden's favorite TV show when you have that character that, you didn't remember the name, that Lauren Green character, blah, 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 telling us all what to do all the time. That's the image of the United States that people have in the world, that we are out there saying to the rest of the world, you know, you have to follow our way, our way or the highway. Lauren Green and Bonanza. People want to find their own way. Yeah, move it. You know, I, I, it's a huge factor, obviously. I mean, it was in Iraq. I mean, I think um, in Abu Ghraib and, and our presence in Iraq was a, uh, undoubtedly a recruiting poster for the jihadi movement. Well, just to ask a sort of, uh, yeah, Rob. Uh, Robert Pape of the University of Chicago has done a long, you know, look at suicide attacks, and he, his main claim is it's largely a nationalist response to foreign occupation, and, and the religious component is pretty small. Do you agree with that? I don't, because the religious component was the f foremost. Whether you, I spoke to people in Indonesia, Pakistan, Middle East, the religious component was the most important for them. So I just don't think that's right, and I don't think it's right. I mean, if you, you know, I don't, I don't know how many uh, people that he actually talked to in coming to that conclusion. Well, I mean, this is based on, you know, the University of Chicago's very large data set. I don't agree with him either, but I'm just based, you know, what do you, th I mean, in terms of your... It's not what I found. Right. When I interviewed, you know, these folks, it's just not what I found. And it doesn't explain cases like Pakistan, where there's been an ep epidemic of suicide attacks, which are clearly not a response to foreign occupation. No, no. there is no foreign occupation. Right. I mean, and, it's and in Saudi Arabia, the same in Saudi thing. Arabia, it's the same thing. So I, I, I don't think that's right. Um, I, I think that sometimes it can be a response to foreign occupation. Again, one size fits all. You have to be very careful about. Right. Let's get some in the back, Jennifer. Thanks. Thank 
Uh, hello, I'm Rob Dubois, um, a security advisor and uh, the author of PowerfulPeace.net. And I appreciate the book. I can't wait to get into it because it's the human side of the terrorists. The terrorist is a two-dimensional cartoon character. Real quick, Ken, you've got to watch uh, Looking for a uh, Comedy in the Muslim World with Albert Brooks about a, a Jew sent to the Muslim world by uh, Fred Thompson. Yeah. Um, real quick, I've had the same conversation you talked about with the, uh, the jihadi that embraced you as a friend with the commander of uh, Russian Special Forces. When we understand human beings as the human being first and then all the, the dirty dark secrets about our background, our, our religion or whatever the objectionable uh, factors are, it, it becomes um, it's secondary. It's less important and less of a, a barrier between us. How would you like to see this book used for the policy we're talking about? Because if you can reach constituents, you can reach politicians, and they won't see the two-dimensional terrorist in a, a man dress. Yeah, I, 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 I would like, I mean, I'm not sure. I don't have all the policy answers, and I really feel like the more you learn, the more you know, the less you can actually come up with clear-cut right answers. But, you know, I'd, I'd really like some policymakers and military leaders to read this book, because um, I think it might give them a different insight. Hi, I'm Mike Shoemaker from Coast Guard Headquarters. I had uh, sort of two related questions. Have you interviewed any American jihadis to see if they have similar views to the ones that you interviewed overseas? And the second is, you talked about dreams. I was told by a former State Department person that numerology plays a role in um, Islamic thinking and, and how Al-Qaeda does things that certain numbers mean certain things. If you could comment on yeah, that. No, that, there's a scene in the book about that, actually, um, where the number 19 apparently had uh, some significance, and that's discussed at length, um, and um, it, it, that is discussed in the book. Uh, so the, um, uh, you know, in, 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 in the book, everyone comes from a, a different uh, background. I mean, there are the kind of people that you talked about who grew up with nothing, in dirt poverty, who go to madrasa. It's the only education Malik had. He wasn't offered none other. He couldn't go anywhere else. So he went there, and that's what he learned. And then, so he had in this notion that he was trying to follow the right path and do good in the world. And he became a Taliban. At 19 years old, he became in charge of a, of a whole region of eastern uh, Afghanistan for the religious police. At 19 years old, what did he know of the world? Nothing. So he was, um, came from that kind of background. There are other people who came from a background of great wealth. Kamal uh, had in his control a fortune of $143 million. He was on the cusp of transferring that over to al-Qaeda or the Taliban. And I won't tell you what stopped them. You'll have to read the book. Um, the US, sorry. The US, the US Treasury Department? <laughs> no, it wasn't the US <laughs> Treasury. But can imagine, I, I don't know, most, this is an educated audience, and I'm not just saying that uh, I can tell from the questions. But the 9-11 attacks cost $500,000. That's the general consensus. and. Uh, you know, Al-Qaeda is basically broke. The Taliban is not flooded with money. I mean, so uh, that kind of fortune, had it been transferred, would have represented a real threat. So, uh, but my point is, everyone comes from a different background, and you can be radicalized by personal events in your life, by, it's not just one thing. It's not just America invades Iraq and everybody becomes radical. That is a myth. But I think the, the gentleman had a potentially very, uh, from the Coast Guard, had a potentially very good idea for your next book, Ken. Well, there you go. American Jihadis. And I, I, I didn't answer that. What I wanted to say is, no, I haven't. But some of the people I interviewed were, came from great wealth and great privilege as people in this country a lot do as well and who have become radicalized. So you can, Bin Laden came from a very successful family. So it's not always the motto of coming up from poverty that does it. In fact, many of the leaders don't, and many of the people I interviewed didn't. This lady here. Hi, I'm Julia Pfaff. I spent 2007 to 2009 teaching in Kuwait business. My husband was a defense attaché. Just a couple of things. Your, your description of the long-bearded man you were describing in the beard was some of the stories my husband told me when he went out to meet with the Salafists. He said it was like going to a Baptist potluck dinner 
they were they're all very nice to him they all were wonderful but my real question goes it seems like there's a theme running through this and I saw this when I was teaching that there's there's a sense in which there can be a poverty of purpose not poverty of want but a poverty of purpose and in all the descriptions that you've given it's it seems like you're going after love you're going after erasing something, but th it seems like purpose plays a huge role in why they may choose to become jihadists. Yeah. What? Yeah, we, and which we're, and it's sort of part of that is somebody who you know, spent so much time in Saudi Arabia. I mean, one of, uh, and I think this is true in the Arab world in general, it's, and going to this question about purpose, there's a huge underemployment problem. I mean, the sort of, you know, Mohammed Atta, if he'd gone back to Egypt after his PhD in Germany, he would have been a cab driver for sure. So to what extent is this lack of purpose or this underemployment or this sort of de defeated expectations part of any of this? It's, uh, I think it's a part of it. Um, you said Ahmad Bernie, who goes to Iraq, couldn't find work. And that was true of half the young Saudis in his country. It's also a pro product of the education system. In Saudi Arabia, public schools, these are government schools, half the classes are religious classes. People are not taught skills that are useful in the world. I mean, and you, so you graduate, you may know the holy book, um, but that may be all you know. So to compete in the 20th century uh, um, world that we're in, you know, the globalized environment, um, that's difficult. 21st century, thank you. Even if that was true in the 20th century. But Any other questions? Hi, I'm uh, Constantine. I'm a fellow here. I just had a quick sort of uh, following up on this methodological question, uh, the question of language, um, sort of what language you conducted the interviews in, uh, the ones where you may have used an interpreter, sort of, you seem to have this, developed this sort of sense of intimacy with a lot of the people and how using an interpreter may have sort of affected yeah. that. It, it depended on the interview. Um, uh, three of the people I interviewed uh, was largely one-on-one. -on -one. They spoke, I don't speak Pashto, they spoke fluent English. You know, when you go to the education system and, and, and they, they went to good schools and they spoke, when I say fluent English, I mean fluent English. Same for Kamal. Kamal was raised in part by an American tutor. His English was flawless and his immersion in American culture was amazing, even to me. So for some of them, and, and, and it enabled some of the closeness, uh, there were, uh, Malik is a, is a Taliban who went to the Madras, I was talking about him. He did not speak any English very limited, and I relied on uh, a journalist, and then later Shahid to conduct um, the translations. And then for Abi and um, Ahmad, I had doc Dr. Ali and, and my favorite translator who I talk about in the book, so it depended on the interview. And having Dr. Ali, their, their psychologist there, was vital because when each of them wanted to clam up with me, he would say, no, it's okay, why don't you tell them the story about such and such? And I always wondered at that moment whether the Saudis had a different definition of doctor-patient privilege than we have in the West, but anyway. Well, that raises a pretty interesting question. You know, Saudi, of course, I mean, going back to the question of who's going to be made unhappy or happy by the book, I mean, Saudi Arabia is such a closed society and there's so little real reporting about what's going on. Uh, how do you think they will react to, because after all you have this, I mean, Saudi Arabia plays such a big role, uh, both the re rehabilitation program and also this character, Kamal, who's a, a member of the Wahhab family. Uh, do you, uh, what, what do you, I mean, are you well, going to get a Saudi visa again? Let's ask I, that. I, I don't know the answer to that. The <laughs> Saudis will have to answer that themselves. <laughs> I hope so. I have friends in that country. I'd like to go back. Um, and uh, Saudi Arabia is very, it's a quarter of the world's oil reserves. I mean, uh, it's very important to our future. And the future of the Muslim world, as one gentleman pointed out, of the spending of the billions and billions and billions on building uh, madrasas. And you go to Pakistan, you go to Indonesia, and you physically see these places that the Saudi government has built. And you go inside and you hear the teachings. Uh, so it's very important. Uh, hello, uh, yes. Uh, my name is Shoji Motoka. I'm currently the uh, uh, 
visiting fellow of uh, Johns Hopkins University of Science, and I originally came from the uh, you know Japanese public broadcaster NHK, and mm -hmm. uh, I used to be a former bureau chief of uh, Islamabad uh, for three years, 2006 to 2009. Actually, I'm surprised to see you are you are American, and uh, American person could do this such kind of you know, exclusive interview with uh, these people because I also did same same kind of things, but you know. In Pakistan, you know, Japanese is kind of you know advantage because we are, we, are, we are low profile. Uh, I mean, low profile target of uh, Taliban or these people. Although these people kind of have a have a kind of you know, sympathy to my country because they are, they are using a uh, Toyota or Nissan for suicide attack. Or this <laughs> I'm sorry, this is just joking. They drive two Oh, yeah. Anyway, yes. Uh, uh, in in Pakistan, I, I I know how you know people are going. You know. Of course, you know American people are followed by followed by, you know searched and followed by the ISI, or uh, you can easily become a very high profile. Have you ever uh, you know feel any kind of uh, you know experience, or uh, you know ha have you ever a feeling of some you know dangerous things, or uh, some you know the harassment from these people? In well, Zeddy, who's profiled in the book, told me um, he said the following. And he had worked as a, uh, for the ISI, was paid for the ISA, which was a fact I was able to corroborate um, through several sources. But anyway, he said to me the following. He said, Ken, I wouldn't be taking vacation anytime soon in the stately mountains of Pakistan, because in Pakistan, accidents happen, even if coincidences seldom do. <laughs> <laughs> So was he threatening you, or what was he? No, he was giving me a warning. I mean, right. he really felt that um, you know that uh, I might be targeted by the ISI. I mean, for the disclosures in the book about ISI uh, helping the radicals. Your career? Well, we'll find out, won't we? <laughs> if I go back to Pakistan, it might limit my career. <laughs> anyway, that's what he told me. I, I'm not, you know, we'll see. Jennifer? Hello, I'm Ursula from the Brookings Institution. I have a two-part uh, Okay, question. I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Uh, hello, I'm That's Ursula from the Brookings Institution. Oh, Is hi. that better? Hi. I have better. a two-part question. Uh, you, you've clearly gone deep into the depth psychology of the people that you've talked with. I would be interested in how it has affected you to be in such contact with such violent people um, and how it might have changed or not. Uh, how you how you view both yourself and your mission, and also I'd be very interested in your perspective on the ethics of um, interviewing live uh, terrorists, meaning ones who are at large uh, planning um, and could detonate at any moment, both for and against. But I would just be interested in hearing what you have to say about that. Yeah. Um, you'll there is a those are both excellent questions. There is a scene in the book. Where one of the when when someone basically gives me his dream or vision of a terrorist attack, and then several months later that attack occurred. Now, I don't know whether he was. I didn't have specific evidence that he was planning an attack because I would have uh, uh, told someone. Obviously, I wouldn't have told someone in Pakistan, but I would have told someone in American intelligence for sure, um, and they could have presumably communicated. I didn't have that specific kind of evidence. And it was only after the fact that I put two and two together. And I'm not really sure that his, that vision was the attack that occurred, but it seemed like it might have been. So it was not the kind of evidence. I mean, maybe that comes from my experience as a prosecutor, where I want hard evidence as opposed to these kind of dreamy type stuff. So not something that would stand up in a court of law, uh, that's for sure. So I didn't feel any need to report it. And it really didn't even make sense to me until afterwards. Um, your first question is, did it change me? You bet it did. Um, I, it changed me quite significantly. To be in a room with somebody, or at that restaurant, and then we went up to the room, and there is a very, very, you know, kind of, to me, moving scene in the book where this fellow, you know, who was a committed jihadi, you know, and, and there was a lot of discussion of Daniel Pearl because the group knew I was Jewish. They Googled me on the internet. And one of the people in the group before this other fellow, he told me, came, they were talking about doing a Daniel Pearl on me. And so this guy met me 
and I have this dream, and he has these conversations, and he tells me about his childhood and how he was raped. He never told anyone in the world. That's the highest kind of dishonor among his fellow people to have that kind of secret come out. He's telling me all this stuff. So, it's, uh, and then he, and then he, you, I almost saw his beliefs undergo a transformation before my very eyes. You bet it moved me. It absolutely moved me. Okay, we've got about 10 minutes, so we'll take these three questions, and then we'll. All right, thank you. I'm Cheryl Smart from the Industrial College of the Armed Forces. Um, you've shared some wonderful insights on the variety of motivations for these individuals, and also that religion is, is an important common motivator. I wonder if you can share any insights on that upper level of leadership that you mentioned um, and what you saw or what you heard as their motivations, and especially if they're uh, uh, the role of religion um, at that leadership level as well. That is another extremely insightful and excellent question because what I saw at the upper levels and what I saw people from the lower levels talking or the mid levels talking about the upper levels is that for some of them, indeed, religion plays an important role. But you have in these movements people who who are corrupted, and I, I met with one Taliban, pretty high up guy, who really wasn't, it's not in the book because he wasn't terribly insightful, he was full of rhetoric, and it was actually quite funny because I was sitting with him and he kept looking up at the sky. He kept looking up, looking up, looking up. So I finally said to him, why do you keep looking up like that? You know, I, I, th I, I didn't do it quite in that tone of voice, I thought it maybe it was some religious thing that I was missing or whatever. He said, well, I'm afraid where the Americans are going to drop a drone on us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I said, well, at least, uh, well, if they do, they'll take out an American citizen along with you. But, um, you know, sometimes the Taliban and the other leaders justify the corruption that they're engaged in by saying, oh, well, the, no, the goal is for religion. And, you know, that's why I say your question's interesting. Query, is it for religion then at that point? Are they still religious beings when they're stealing and lying and doing all of that? Or are they just justifying their behavior? They could still be believing in it. I mean, I don't know, but it, it becomes a, a, a problematic uh, uh, fact for them. And I think it's a missed opportunity from our side. Uh, we just don't see the corruption. And believe me, the people in the movement see it. And it's very ugly to them. And yep. they're, not, they're not convinced by their leader's justification that it's all done in the name of religion. Ed Hussein, who's a former member of his, but Tahir wrote a piece immediately after al Laki was killed saying it would have been more effective just to release his three arrest records for solicitation of prostitutes when he was living in San Diego than to have killed him with a drone. What I, I, I would actually agree with that. I think to expose the, 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 the human foibles of these, some of these leaders out there, get that kind of information out there, hopefully through Muslim sources, hopefully through religious clerics in the Muslim world who want to distance, the, you know, that has more credibility, I think. It's also very dangerous, right? I mean, the guy, the well-known cleric in Lahore who criticized the Taliban, I mean, he's now very, dead. That's right. It's very dangerous. In, in the back and then. And, 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 and people in the movement are true believers, and that's why it's dangerous. I mean. Yes, uh, Scott Rickard with uh, ALS Group. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, risking uh, your life for uh, this story. Uh, when I first saw the title, I thought it was something like... Uh, you know, uh, Robert Spencer was doing a James Bond book or something. So, uh, <laughs> so it's uh, not. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, after this experience, I'd like your opinion on the the writings of the, like the uh, you know the Robert Spencers, the Pamela Gellers, those types, and see, just your opinion of that type of writing. Yeah. No, it, it's it's it's. You know, Peter suggested my next project might be interviewing. Uh, actually, I am writing another book, and one of the themes in that book is how sometimes, so this was from going over Scott and seeing the other side, so to speak. And I think here in America, um, we have a great danger when we demonize and when we uh, vilify people and, and, you know, Sharia in Oklahoma. And I think, you know, that's a very dangerous kind of mentality that uh, can take America on a, on, a, on a path of destruction and create a conflict that doesn't exist. Lady in front. 
You have to a a give her the mic because she gave me the Band-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> She's so well equipped. She's well <laughs> equipped. And I, I don't know how I cut myself. must be on the Coke can. It's probably a, what it was was a paper cut from the book. Well, that's, there you go. It was a paper cut from the book, and I'm prepared because I have four children. <laughs> 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 but um, you said it was very dreams were very important. How easy is it to make up a story and say it was a dream? Well, I don't think it's that easy. You know why? Because when I had my dream, and I shared it with Sha Shahid, who was very immersed in this dream culture, and he knew the Quran by heart. He was a Hafiz, which means he could recite the entire book. So he was very, and he knew all the, you know, he's deeply into the religion. So if I had made something, if I had made that dream up, he would have caught me in it. And then, believe me, it wouldn't have been such a friendly experience with him. He would have saw me as a, bet a betraying, his, I mean, it would have been the end of the, I don't know what he would have done. He might have even taken a knife and killed me on the spot. I don't know. The fact that I answered those questions, and boy, thank God I did. <laughs> the way that comported to his view of what the dream should be. So I think it's pretty hard, actually, to make up these dreams because they have a lot of intricate rules to them about, you know, you'll see this when you read the book. Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a whole canon of dream interpretation and what a particular dream means and why it says this and why it says that stuff. So actually, I think it would be difficult for someone to make it up. Even for their leaders to, if they want to do something, just make up a dream and say, well, no, I, I, I just don't think it works that way. I think that, w you know, because I just think they have the dreams. Now, what may happen is that if you know dreams are important and you want to do something, maybe your unconscious takes over and you have a dream. But I think making up a dream would be something that if ever found out would get you... Uh, <laughs> How do you find out, though? Uh, <laughs> because you do, because it's, it, 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 it's not just... I went to the, you know, have, have a certain dream. There's a whole culture of dream interpretation. And so if you, if you, uh, you know, misstep this at all, people would see that as inauthentic. You know, it's interesting in the 9-11 report, there's a lot of discussion of the dreams that people within Al-Qaeda were having. Um, and, and, and Bin Laden was very concerned about the dreams people were having within Al-Qaeda before the 9-11 event because he felt that some of these dreams were getting so close to the reality of what was going to happen that he actually told people to stop talking about their dreams. Right. So not only in the Taliban, but also within Al-Qaeda, this was an important. And in fact, one of the people who had the dreams is mentioned in the book, that is actually in the book because he, he I mean, he was at a terrorist ca training camp, trained by Zeddy, and he had this dream which everyone interpreted as, as the 9-11 attacks, the day of the attacks. I mean, so, or the, you know, the, when it was on the TV, he had this dream the night before that he told everyone. I mean, you know, uh, dreams are quite subjective, and so you can, you know, interpret them as you wish. Well, we'll interpret this as a really wonderful event, <laughs> and thank you for doing That's it. Good. <laughs> and it's not a dream. You're all in reality in this room. <laughs> I have extra books. How should we dream of it? I'm happy to Oh, yeah, and also Ken will be signing books for those who would like... Yes. Here, what about uh, Chris Hedges' book, War Gives Meaning to Life?